Hi, I'm Jason Kreidner. I am a um, employee of Texas Instruments. Um, been there a, a fair amount of time, but about well, ten years ago, um, started up this uh, project called BeagleBoard.org. Um, later to become um, a nonprofit uh, separate entity, the BeagleBoard.org Foundation, of which you are. Um, you know, we have uh, it's a it's a nonprofit foundation of which we have five board members and then a, a you know a paid executive director and then everybody else is you know kind of contract jobs here and there. Um, you're fortunate enough that um, we have a quorum in here today. We have two other board members. Um, so I'm the only board member that works for for TI. Uh, Drew works for Osh Park, does some contract work for Adafruit. Um, Robert's full time at DigiKey. Um, the other two guys are professors and didn't travel to uh, Embedded Linux Conference. So one's at Rose Holman, the other one's, um, um, was it Brown and MIT? Most, uh, he's a professor at MIT most recently. I think he might still be there. Um, but he has a new kids also, so that's um, keeping his life busy. So that's, that's the, the structure of, of, of BeagleBoard. But I'm still an employee of, of, of TI, but BeagleBoard is itself a, a separate entity. Um, I want to talk to you about USB Net Console or bring, bring, doing board bring up um, using Net Console and USB um, without a serial debug net. That's not really 100% practical today, um, but we want to try to dive into the issues. Hopefully, some of the folks in, in the room are actually some of the ones that we're going to be working with to ultimately solve the problems um, that still exist. Um, that they, they're, there's still a, a, a handful of them that are, that are, that are real. Um, but things are to a point um, that you can essentially boot over USB, get to um, a U-boot prompt, which is really cool, um, and then and also get to you know to, to kernel um, to reasonably early kernel messages. Although I have some some work on myself to, with regards to USB. Um, so anyway, I, I, won't, I don't want to give away the ending. Um, so um, I don't need to go over that. Um, that was the, that was in your your um, show description. So I'm going to talk about what USB Net Console is. That's kind of the background theory. Um, then I'm going to go in, in, into my example, um, uh, uh, and uh, then I'm going to just kind of step back out of that at the end, um, just to try to uh, or, um, give you some, you know some 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 inputs on why this is um, this is really cool. You must think it's might be kind of cool in some way. Um, maybe you wouldn't be there, and then I'll end talking to some of the issues. How many of you have actually used Net Console already? Because um, I know a number of people I've met have used Net Console on server farms, right, to try to eliminate the serial cable uh, nightmare. Um, but not too many of you have used um, um, that. So I imagine even fewer of us, anybody ever used USB um, networking and Net Console at the same time. Yeah, kind of. That's impressive. I, there was, that there was anybody that even tried it, um, <laughs> which is cool. But we're, after by the time you're out of here and you go to the GitHub and follow this, you will, you too, will be able to um, do USB-based um, net console. Um, how many of you have any patches in the kernel? A, a few. Okay, quite quite a few. Yes. Awesome. Okay, I feel this is going to be a super incredibly productive thing then, yes. Um, um, traditional, um, the way that we usually work with uh, embedded systems, kind of just jumping past JTAG, right? You know, JTAG is, is um, what, a lot of people, um, what a lot of people do, but when you get into a Linux SBC world, right, and you get into the kernel, right, just give me the stinking serial port and let me do print K, and I'm gonna debug all my drivers with print K. And, um, and that's a really, a really, <laughs> a really common way. Yes, lots of thumbs up on that. Uh, get rid of that um, obnoxious little JTAG thing and you know, get, allow me to do my printfs and allow me to add my debug statements. Um, the sooner I can get to trace functions, the better. But uh, you know, for now, um, like as I'm trying to do initial, you know, to do that bring up, just print K. Um, and that's really, that's really pretty cool. So what it typically looks like is you, know, you have two wires, really, that, that, that matter. There's power and ground, and there's these transmit and receive lines. Um, to wire it up on a, on a, on a board, um, sometimes you'll need some other ones, right? You might need RTS, CTS, those are the most common, uh, clear to send and ready to send um, as handshaking. Uh, most, most of you guys doing embedded systems, these stuff will, will not use those in your configs and just say, you know, let everything flow, flow free and um, if I drop stuff, I drop stuff, whatever. Um, 
because you just want to you just want to get some output. And there's other signals, but like so there's a little bit of wiring challenge. It's not that complex from a wiring standpoint, but you do have to dedicate a port. Um, you do have to get something physically wired up um, in order to go and do that. And you know, anytime you're doing debug, what you really care about is reducing configuration steps that are error prone. Right, you, you don't want to run into the situation. You know, with JTAG, it's mostly did I get the pull-ups or pull-downs right. With USB, did I get the baud rate right? Did I have the right number of stop bits? Um, you know, and it, you know, you could it, um, data bits eight in one these days is a pretty safe assumption, um, and um, uh, but but you still have the baud rate to deal with. Well, how fast is your serial port running at? You have to, you know, you can kind of try to do some auto baud rate detection if you have the right hardware. But if you get it wrong, you screw up. So there's there's still it's still error prone, um, even even at that level um, when configuring the hardware. Um, so what is Net Console? That's essentially networked serial, right? It's a way to get the base functionality of a serial connection, but instead of uh, transmitting it over the transmit and receive lines, um, I'm going to send UDP packets. And the format is really, really, really simple. If I want to send a data byte, I throw it into UDP packet, UDP packet um, and it's the length, of the, the length of the UDP packet says how much data there is, and, um, and that's it. That's how I send data one direction and receive it the other direction um, over the wire. Pretty darn simple. Not a lot of uh, configuration headaches. You can potentially configure. You get to create a configuration issue here with a port number. Um, you know, if you're doing Net Console, uh, the the typical thing is to put it over port six 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 six. The extra six is important. Uh, I don't know if they, what these guys were thinking. You know, they thought it was particularly evil or extra extra evil. Anyway. Um, and then, you know, you know, specify some little IP addresses and go. So that IP address uh, specification part, right, is also kind of tricky, right? You're trying to boot up a device and get into it and, and go do other things. So, um, so you know, you can, you can hard code those on a subnet um, if you have an isolated, you know, Ethernet subnet um, and, and, and go about things that way. Um, but if you're sharing the network with other things, then you need to think a little bit more about the process uh, for getting those, those, um, those magic IP addresses. And if you've seen the, the networking stacks, right, this is essentially the buildup. You got your Ethernet packet, um, you know, and you're using IP to specify so the, the source address, destination address, right, so it's IP routed. Um, and then you've got the UDP packet, which has the port numbers in it. Um, to say that it's source port, destination port, just do 6666, don't do play with any of the funny port remapping stuff anyway. Um, it's just like set those ports, don't have to do anything funky there, um, and then the length, and then their payload, right? And the payload's your bits, right? So it's, 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 it's pretty simple from a, from a, from a networking perspective. Um, that IP address stuff is the only place where you kind of add some, you need, you need to put up a couple little services somewhere to kind of handle these things on that network. Now, if you have any other computers on the network with, with running um, network stacks, they already do this, right? So, um, but at least with the first one. So ARP is the address resolution protocol. That's how you get the IP address. You, you associate the MAC address with the IP address of the server that you're going to be talking to. Where, who's the, in this case, the server is the one you're viewing all the net console data, right? So there's the server, and then there's the target system. Um, and so the, the target system is going to send out an, 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 an ARP proxy or probe, probe, that's the term, an ARP probe. Um, and then everything on the LAN is going to send back, here's my IP address and here's my MAC address. So when you want to send Ethernet packets to this IP address, you send them to this Ethernet MAC address. Um, and, so it makes, and so it builds up an ARP table um, on the, the target and it can send um, to, you know, it has that, that it now knows the, the MAC address for the particular IP address. Um, but then if you're sitting on, an, on a network, and you, know, you, you, could, you, have, you could potentially statically configure the IP, um, and, and, but you'd have to still know the, the MAC address. Uh, anyway, you, you could do that on, all on the target, uh, but more typically if you're sitting on a shared network or, or just, just about any real configuration, you want to try to do something like BootP or DHCP to get the target's IP address, right? So the ARP 
tells the target what the server's IP address is. Now, how does it find out its own? It's going to go do a boot P um, and try to get its own um, IP address. Um, so it, it may also, um, this may be also where it gets the magic information of, well, what am I actually going to load to boot? Um, so if I'm going to boot, I'm going to transfer data with TFTP. Uh, the boot P packet would also contain the file name of what it wants you to load. Um, so what the server wants to serve up on the, to, to the, to the part target device to boot. Um, this is, this is, hopefully this is a, a lot of detail, um, but I'm not going to go any deeper. Um, so you need those um, in order to, to get the, the IP addresses, and that's kind of the hardest part in the configuration, but there's, there's stuff there to do that. Um, now we're going to add that extra layer. Um, um, uh, maybe I should do these out of order. We're, we're gonna, we're, now we need to, to, to add that extra layer, which is to do that all over, um, instead, of, um, uh, instead of over a real Ethernet, hardware Ethernet, where we've got an Ethernet card in both computers, um, we're going to do that over USB. Um, so it, the, the, the drawing looks pretty similar, except down here, down at the very bottom for the physical layer, um, you've got this extra element to the protocol, which is our Indus. Um, remote network device, I don't freaking know. Um, just it's the, it's, the, it's the way to encapsulate, uh, it's a way to encapsulate Ethernet packets over USB. Um, the, um, uh, the CDC standard has another way, ECM, there's TLA, TLA, TLA. Um, but but it's, it's a way that we're going to be using to, to transfer those Ethernet packets over um, your USB bus. Hopefully I don't have to explain USB as a TLA. No? Anybody not know what USB is if we're in the right room? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Somebody's listening anyway. Um, so we're going, to use, we're going to use, for our example, we're going to use RNDIS, right? There's different, different ways that you can go and do it. But, and uh, RNDIS plus TFTP, the nice thing is it's supported in the processor that we're going to be using. It's supported in the boot ROM. Um, so the boot ROM actually understands how to do uh, USB or RNDIS. It's going to look like a network device uh, to, my, to my host computer. Um, and the... Uh, this, the, there's some of this is kind of just it gets in, incorporated all within the device side driver. So that's the the host PC looks like it gets an Ethernet device, um, but inside the the target device it also looks like it has you know in the driver it has its own Ethernet device. So it looks like there's two Ethernet adapters connected directly to each other over an Ethernet cable, but yet no Ethernet exists. Right. So USB just makes it you know, on the USB class drivers just make it look like. Your host gets an Ethernet adapter. I have my virtual Ethernet adapter, and we're going to talk Ethernet even though there's no Ethernet. There's just USB. Lose everybody? I saw some heads nod. That's awesome, because that's, that's the hardest concept I'm going to go over today. All right, it's all downhill from here. Um, but, but it's nice that the, the, the boot ROM and the device actually understands our indus and TFTP. You provide it um, code that you want it to run by TFTP. It shoves that into the internal SRAM in the, the processor. Uh, that then configures the uh, DDR on the processor and triggers off. Um, so U-Boot U uh, itself, there's a SPL thing, a secondary program loader. Um, that's tiny and it fits inside that internal memory. That understands USB RNDIS and TFTP as well. So from that SPL, you can, you, you know, so the SPL configures the DDR. Um, so from that SPL, we're going to TFTP now into the DDR. Um, and what we're going to put in there is U-Boot. Um, so U-Boot itself, the big U-Boot, not the tiny little version of it that's SPL, that's all shrunk down to, to just do one exact thing. Now we've got U-Boot, which is an extremely flexible uh, bootloader base that we have to work from and a great way to do your board debug and bring up, right? So you're now in... Um, a nice environment. So that, so SPL knows how to do that RNDIS and TFTP and get you into U-Boot, and U-Boot supports Net Console. Um, and it really doesn't care what it's putting Net Console over. It wants to put it, it needs UDP packets, and, um, and that's all it needs. U-Boot provides a service for doing networking. Um, it plugs into that stack that does it over USB. 
right? So, so you boot doesn't necessarily care if you're using Ethernet or um, at least at some, some level of abstraction, it doesn't care um, whether it's using um, ether, real Ethernet or USB Ethernet. Um, but we'll deal with some of the, the particulars. And also Linux understands how to do, um, I mean, obviously Linux knows how to do everything, but it knows how to do the USB RNDIS and that console as well. Um, I'm gonna move back, talk about how some of that's accomplished. I think, it, you know, just to, to kind of make sure you got that, that USB gadget concept. Um, so the client drivers are running on the target, right? So you've got, you've got this, um, this gadget uh, driver. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the Linux terminology for it at least, but it just means that I'm acting like a, a device, a target, not the, not the guy that's actually driving the USB bus, but the guy that's like answering the USB bus requests, right? And USB, all the transactions, all the transfers are initiated by the host and the target just really answers them. So there's a driver that knows how to answer those requests um, and treat them as, um, as, as network, right? So a gadget driver, like, you know, is to something like act like the, U the USB fob that, store that you have that you plug in has the, the, the flash memory on it, to act like the fob, not to host the fob, right? It's not, what you, it's not, what, it's not what's reading the disk, it's what's serving the information of the disk off. And, um, and in USB, everything, all the, 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 the clients are grouped in classes to simplify the host design, right? So there's, um, so we just, you know, we're using a networking class um, uh, driver. And um, RNDIS is one of those classes um, that provides USB Ethernet. CDC eSIM is another, but, you know, forget about that. That's actually a better one in, in tremendous amount of respects, um, but it's not the one that the AM335 ROM implements. That's where the, 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 the train goes. So why did I want to do any of this in the first place? Um, there's actually, a, there's a lot of reasons. Um, uh, ultimately trying to actually boot these devices from the browser and really expose um, you know, more users uh, to really low levels um, so they can build some understanding. But from a practical standpoint, what was the tipping point that said, okay, I'm actually gonna open up you know, Pandora's box and start playing with USB Net Console. Um, it was actually the Pocket Beagle production. So it's a new, that's what I'm doing the demos on. It's a new single board computer. Um, it's 25 bucks and all that stuff, but we needed some way to test them in production and to uniquely serial number them because we do that for all the Beagles and we like to be able to identify when it was built and, and, and all this um, fun stuff. I don't know if the serial numbers are all that really necessary, but we've kind of committed to doing it. And so we're gonna do it. And so we needed some place where we can get those unique numbers and really quick. Um, so the, the Pocket Beagle tester um, runs in um, like three seconds, like two, three seconds. Um, you know, and it's, um, um, we, what I, I started out actually trying to boot everything over USB, but it boots up a whole lot faster. Um, if I boot U-Boot off of the micro SD, so I ended up using U, the micro SD to boot U-Boot, but it then enabled um, Net Console um, for communications over the USB line where I'm fetching the serial numbers, um, fetching some basic tests, facing, fetching some scripts um, that are actually gonna go and like set the LEDs. Um, so the, you know, that, that it, 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 it actually issues those, um, those, those commands over the, the, the USB Net Console. And I'm actually gonna bring up some code now here because this is a live, uh, oh, I'm not gonna bring up some code because I can't get to the internet. Um, man, I wanted to show that. Um, so in, the, in this just, uh, there's my, like that, that particular, there's a, I checked in binary files, which is always ugly, but I did also include uh, the commit IDs so you can look at the versions of U-Boot. Um, that I that I built with this and and you know to my repo that has the the, the, the patches for it um, But I actually have a JavaScript routine that I'm running on a, a, a BeagleBone black um, Actually a BeagleBone black wireless technically um, that when you when you want to test the pocket beagles um, You plug in the micro SD that has U boot on it um, and then you you plug in the USB coming out of the the um, uh, the, the, the BeagleBone black wireless and it um, uh, that powers it up, right? So the USB connection powers it up, boots up um, uh, um, the, the, the U-boot and enables the net console. Um, I then in the JavaScript code, I'm just using um, the UDP, I'm using the, 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 the TCPI framework that's on the, the Pocket Beagle um, to um, 
you know, just send streams of, of, um, of U-boot commands. All right, so I just send the streams of U-boot commands to do different operations, including writing the serial number. And then the serial number that's on, it's living, you know, the, the, the file that stores the serial number is living there on the BeagleBone Black Wireless, and it increments that every time it tests one successfully. Um, and it updates the LEDs to tell you if it actually completed or not. Um, happens really quick, and it's nice. But since then, um, you know, last minute, of course, always. But that's what gave me the confidence that said I can come out here and, and, and talk about this. Um, but it wasn't really where I wanted to be at to come talk, and that all happened in the last couple of days. Um, but we took this, this project that we'd done um, at last year's Google Summer of Code uh, called Node Beagle Boot, um, which implements the, um, all those critical servers that we're talking about over um, Node USB, which is just a, a Node.js wrapper for libUSB. Um, so it, it takes libUSB, if it sees the right vendor's IDs, it grabs it and says it's mine, and then it implements all of those protocols. It implements the RNDIS, it implements the ARP, it implements the boot P, it implements the TFTP, all in Node.js. Um, all right, so, um, so, it, so it, 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 it provides all those. And so I wanted to, to add on to that the support for uh, Net Console, which is now there. Um, so hopefully I actually have a demo. Um, the nice thing about putting it all into this one application versus just using the services that are on the, the device is, heck, I can't even remember how I configured my BeagleBone Black Wireless in order to make it answer uh, all the services things. So, like, it just takes away the confusion. It makes sure everything all in one place, right? So it doesn't depend on the host configuration. Um, like, you're not messing with the host's network stack, right? If this is my platform that I want to be, uh, you know, acting with, do I really want to like, you know, set up specific network interfaces to always come up to these static IPs, or if I, I'm on wireless network. Anyway, it, it's, it becomes a real pain in the ass. Um, so we get, get rid of any of that, that changes to your, to your real host system. And, you know, we want to get this into, um, like, a different Electron apps, namely Etcher, right? So Etcher is a tool that, um, like, the Node Beagleboot was originally done to bring up um, um, USB mass storage class on the target device so that you can actually write the onboard flash of a BeagleBone Black, right, without having to have, you know, any other boot source, right? You just boot up over USB and I can reflash the device. So, so bring up uh, either U UMS in either uh, Linux or in even U-Boot has UMS support now. Um, so the Node.js one is actually using the UMS on, in U-Boot. Um, the previous generation that we wrote in the, the, the server in C had used uh, you know, a small Linux image and was using that. The Linux image is a little bit faster acting as max st mass storage class uh, than U-Boot is, um, but you really, like, simplicity is king, um, and just getting it to it in U-Boot is really, really nice. So you can make an Electron app. If you don't know, it's a Node.js framework for actually making GUI standalone applications. It's cross-platform. Um, you know, potentially now with this, I can you know, create an Electron app that's going to give me a console, a U-Boot console, um, in an Electron app. And um, in the future, um, because of the, the API for 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 libUSB for Node USB is largely similar uh, to the to the Web USB uh, API. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw in the, the while I'm thinking about them. I'll go ahead and throw in some of the limitations. Um, Web USB does have an issue that we were a little bit concerned about initially. Issue, a it's not very secure to begin with, but um, from a security standpoint, it says if your host has a driver um, for uh, that device, um, you know it's going to grab the, um, um, the it's going to grab a hold of it, and um, and you're not going to be able to grab it with Lib with, with with sorry with Web USB. Um, the workaround is pretty simple. We change all the descriptors, so it doesn't load a driver, right? If you control the other end of the wire, just change the descriptors. Web USB won't grab it, and we can grab it. Um, you know, it kind of sucks from a from a you know you know keeping everything general. So if you want to build other host stacks, you can, um, but it allows us to take control over it. Um, now, um, the other thing is, um, you know, yeah, uh, and so it implement, I already mentioned that it implements all these different protocols, so let's get on to it. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I won't, I'm trying to put some of these slides up front because once I actually go into the demo, I don't want to try to go back to slides. Um, so um, goals for Node BeagleBoot, right? We want to try to get Node BeagleBoot in this net console context. 
get to interactivity as soon as possible, right? Get to the point where we're, where we're actually, you know, peeking, peeking and poking things inside the device um, under our control as quickly as possible. Really minimize the hardware dependencies, right? So all I need for a system now is USB, right? USB is providing power, it's providing communications, you know, it's booting it. I don't need anything else. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, so running in a browser is where we're headed. Um, Etcher is also entirely kind of redundant there. Um, eventually, um, uh, keeping it. So right now, the limitation of my demo is that it comes up to U-Boot Net Console um, uh, for, you know, I, I'm not able to take that on into the kernel booting. Um, so the, it's possible, and I've got some... Um, I, my slides are kind of out of order in this. I'm going to answer it here and not spend the time on the other slide. Uh, it's possible to actually create a console in U-Boot and, and expose that through UEFI and essentially carry that console on through boot, right? So that uh, as the kernel is booting, if you're providing the UEFI service, it keeps that stuff alive. Um, essentially, if you're a DOS programmer, like think of Terminate and Stay, stay Resident, um, sort of like, like world, um, but it, it creates hooks um, so that I, can, I could do that um, in the future where I can keep that console alive, the same console, on through the process of booting the kernel. Um, you know, today you can run some scripts and kind of restart in a console. Uh, the biggest, one of the, one of the bigger issues, I should say, with running net console over USB with the kernel is the wonderful advent of configfs. Configfs, if if you if, you know if you're yeah, uh, for those who know, uh, it, it uh, you know it provide you configure your USB, but it doesn't allow you to do it statically and pre-boot, right? It doesn't really get you. It doesn't get very early. It actually relies on user space being up before you start poking um, configfs. Uh, that's great for those of us that love to hack and and you know create keyboard emulators and all the the cool stuff that it can do, um, but it's a pain in the ass when you want it up really early. Um, so I, ideally for me, it would be both in the device tree as well as in configfs, um, but uh, most of those drivers don't support um, today, as far as I know, don't support any sort of like uh, device tree level configuration. You can compile gmulti uh, and hard code that into the, to the kernel, so it's kind of a legacy gadget driver. Um, you can, you can get there reasonably early that way, um, but you'll see in my, my final wrap-up slide is next steps. That's something I haven't tried um, to this point because I was just happy to get um, my, my, my U-Boot stuff running. So what can you do in U-Boot? So what's this big deal about getting to a console, um, you know, booted over USB um, U-Boot? Well, I can do a lot in USB. I can read and write memory all over the place. I can read and write files on just about um, any sort of file system. I can read and write them off of SD cards or USB sticks, um, spy flash, NAND flash, um, and you know, all, all sorts of, of devices. Um, I'm now enabled to go and, and talk to and create scripts and do things so that I can verify my hardware um, you know, before um, bringing it up into to, to Linux. Um, I can toggle GPIOs. I can, you know, just do generic I squared C or SPI accesses. Um, and the most importantly, um, you know, I can boot the kernel, right? Um, there's currently a a bug in U-Boot with regards to Net Console um, that I haven't yet narrowed down. But if you leave Net Console alive while doing TFTP, U-Boot will crash. Um, so it, the, my workaround is to cut and paste this line um, in at the, the end in order to boot my kernel, right? Um, so I, I turn net console off, um, uh, standard in and standard out. Um, I do my FTP transfers, I then turn net console back on again, um, and then I'm back at the prompt with the TFTPs happening in the background. In the meantime, on my host, I can watch um, things happen, right, because I see all the TFTP transfers happening. So I kind of still know everything's good and clean, um, but I don't get my, my, my console back up until the end. And then I can interactively just run these last few things. The, the RAM args just sets up the boot args, and I'll show you that. Sets up the boot args for the kernel, and then boot Z actually loads and runs the kernel. So at that point, um, yeah, at that point, um, well, okay. This is where to get the code. 
my GitHub, um, Node-BeagleBoot, uh, it's on the net console um, um, uh, fork, or um, yeah, um, branch, sorry, branch, get my Git terminology right. So the net, net, uh, net console branch, I've got it referred to by a build root build uh, image, so I can build kind of everything all in one place, so it builds my kernel, my root file system, and everything, so I have something nice and reproducible. Um, for Node BeagleBoat itself, you get into that directory, you do npm install, um, sudo npm start, you do need to point the bin folder into the uh, build root um, output images folder in order to get to them, plug in my pocket beagle, and then I'm at the net console prompt. Do you believe me? Anybody thinks this is gonna work? Does, does anybody think this is gonna work? All right, man, you, you're way overconfident. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, uh, so, so I do have this other, so I, I talked about being um, uh, without a serial debug net. Um, reality is I've got a serial debug net. It's, it's hidden over there. So I've got that up on the console. Um, it's nice to kind of see things as we're going along, but realize I, I'm, I'm not gonna um, to, to, to do stuff over there other than to show you that this is, um, make sure, you know, like this is currently running, running Linux that I booted earlier, um, but um, it's just gonna be sitting around there for, for nice pretty information pictures. This is the, my, um, let me control C this. Um, this is me running, did I fat finger my keyboard? I felt like I did, yep. And so that, that's, that's my, my, my Node.js based server. So I'm gonna click um, reset button and TFTPing the run from the ROM, uh, uh, TFTPing the whole U-boot. Um, you know, uh, and then when you do the DHCP, for some reason, it, it immediately tries to transfer uh, U-boot image all the time as default. Um, my default uh, boot, arc, boot um, args. So this, this again, this is, this is run, this, that window is running, the window one you're looking at right here is running net console. I can do print boot command. Uh, this is what ran. Right, so it, it did the DHCP um, that caused uboot.image to run, to, to, to transfer over again. Um, that's just the way the DHCP thing seems to work. Um, I set my environment to the NCIP uh, to be the server, right, print uh, server IP. Um, and you also, it also needs, you know, because over DHCP it also got the print IP address. Um, the IP address for the, the target device. Both of those were provided uh, by the node program uh, that answered the DHCP request. Um, so DHCP set the network environment, then set the standard out. Um, so I, when I compiled U-Boot, I compiled it so that it would T, uh, so that you can, can, you can compile U-Boot so that it has net console. Um, and then there's another extra configuration saying it says yeah, I can have more than one at a time. Um, so I can put a comma in there, so I'm keeping the serial active. Um, so I haven't completely turned off my, my debug net at this point, uh, my serial net. Um, and I set standard out, standard error, um, and um, uh, uh, standard in all to be net console. And then I printed version, right? You can see that the version of U-Boot printed on the screen. Um, hey, it worked. So at least to there, right? So we're at least now in U-Boot. And I mentioned you could do um, a, a lot of things um, in U-Boot. Oh, and this is kind of cool. Like anytime I type in here, that's the, over the serial port, right? It just automatically shows up on the net console um, over the UDP packets. Um, but I can do things like GPIO, um, set uh, 53. Oh, I've got a cape on the top of this, but that turned on, that turned on an LED under there. Um, 53 is the user zero LED. Oh, I can't. Uh, limitation, sorry. I'm so used to working at the serial port. Uh, what, I, what I'm currently doing on, um, uh, in, in Node.js, um, it's, it's not actually gonna capture any of the standard in until I press enter. Um, so I'm used to just typing. Um, it's, it, it, if, if I edit my Node.js thing to actually grab live keys, it would be sending those over because right now I can't press, can't press the history and do all that, that fun stuff. Um, but that's a, that's a Node.js side thing. Um, you've got a lot of commands in here, too many to show. Um, I2C, right, you, um, 
<laughs> Where, where's the, the help? That's not much help. Um, so I can do SPI commands. Um, if I can remember the right one, SSPI uh, one colon one uh, bit length of 32, um, data out of 40, zero, 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 zero. Sounds good. Oh, crap. <laughs> Um, apparently that wasn't quite the right um, the, the, the correct the right um, SPI command line, but um, you know you could. I, I was going to try to turn on some more fun LEDs. Um, anyway, brought me right back into here. I'm I'm happy again. Um, you know, if I, I plug in a USB drive, I, I did test like I could do USB start and unlist contents of disks. Uh, there I can, um, you know, I print out what the the SPL is configured the um, uh, what's the, the BD info? Oh, yeah. Um, so you can see some of the, the stuff in, in the, embedded in the info. There's a there's a there's a lot of stuff that you can you can you can do from here um, to 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 work with your target environment um, and bring up a new board. And I haven't had to add anything um, funky to your board. I want to copy and paste that line. Let me see if I can do it from memory. What's the chances I could do the the kernel boot from memory? Um, uh, probably not very good. Standard, standard out to serial. Um, set environment uh, standard in to serial. I don't know. I don't think I have to do standard error because I don't think it tries to send anything across it. TFTP the kernel into the load address. Z image. TFTP uh, the. Um, let's get the short one. Let's get the let's get the finite device tree first or flattened device tree. Sorry. Um, if I put the right number of Ds in there, AM335X pocket beagle dot DTB. Um, TFTP, the RAM disk, the um, RDADR, um, it's called um, root FS dot CPI PIO dot uboot, has to be uboot packaged. One of the 10 minute, thank you. Um, at that point, I should have everything loaded into memory. So we're going to set environment standard out back to serial, comma net console, and set environment standard in back to serial and net console. Pray, pray them if you got them. I don't know. Does that quite work? Um, and now we're going to actually go and do the, the, the TFTP transfers of all those, um, of all those other images. So um, while that's running, um, this is a good point for a few questions. Because this, this is the meat of the demo. This is the part that's supposed to be, woo! Um, uh, you mentioned uh, bringing up a new board, but uh, the I'm not in the kernel, so you can't say that a lot needs to function in the kernel for this because I'm not in the kernel. I'm in the bootloader. Yeah, so. I know, but uh, when you try to kernel, for example, yeah. Yeah. So the, the 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 statement is is this isn't really that great for bringing up the kernel because if there's a bug in the kernel where it can't bring up memory, um, you know, I'm not going to get any sort of useful feedback. Um, yes. Yes. Completely. Completely agree. Uh, UART is UART is much easier from a from a inside the the kernel perspective. Um, you know, my assertion is that this is becoming um, much more stable, um, and that um, the, the the big thing from from our perspective is that some of the things like memory. I mean, I, in U-Boot, I can do a lot of the the hardware testing. Like, I can test the memory. I can test all the the the, the things that are really going to uh, fail. Um, at uh, mostly at the at the hardware level, uh, from a from a kernel and system level, um, what the, the what makes this useful is using something like the the system and in, in package um, that we're using on the Pocket Beagle because the things that we need for to get the kernel to run are all you know very very static and very much the same um, between those systems. The only thing that I have to have work um, to get back uh, the the connection to the 
um, to the, the, the processors, essentially the USB, um, uh, well, every, every, at this point, everything that would need for to run was already be tested um, by bringing it up in, in U-Boot. The SOC support is upstream. The SOC support is upstream. The device tree, I, I can use a minimal device tree that doesn't configure anything um, outside of the, the SIP except for the USB. Um, so I can get that kernel booted um, without any sort of other board level dependencies. Um, so yes, in the case of bringing up a, a really totally new architecture or a new um, you know, a subsystem with, with, with different um, controllers, this doesn't really scale well. Uh, for bringing up new boards based on this system and package, this is really enough. Uh, in fact, we've, I've, I've done, like, like, with basically this set of infrastructure, um, you know, board bring up for, you know, some odd 20 boards, so. And by the way, if you, if you want USB connector, which is uh, great, uh, why not the UART over here? The, the question is, if you really want to use a USB connector, why not use um, uh, UART over USB? Um, that's, a, that's a pretty good question. Uh, and the, what, what, um, what spawned this off initially is the fact that the boot ROM uh, chose to use network over USB, and um, and uh, you know you're still either way on the the, the 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 device side needing to bring up a USB stack um, and a, and a known driver. So um, does it matter too much if you're bringing up the serial drive, the serial gadget driver, or the serial uh, network driver? Um, my assertion is it doesn't matter too much because those bits are pretty darn proven. Um, but um, from a practical standpoint, it could reduce your host infrastructure if you use serial. Um, my big limitation, though, is I needed to do the, the, the ARP, the boot P, all that other junk to handle the ROM. Um, and and that there's no other real good justification for that other than the fact that I had to do them to handle the, the ROM code bef before you boot load, run, loads and runs. Um, but my, my approach here is that because I had to do those things anyway, why not keep doing them? Um, maybe I can bring up the, the, the serial gadget and the kernel faster uh, in the boot stream so I can get more of the print, the print messages. Uh, I really think the solution for getting early messages in the kernel is EFI. Uh, okay, now that's a that's um, that's not that's not that's not quite right. So the the comment was um, I could use a small hardware piece um, to essentially convert from the the, the target um, um, USB to some hardware serial where I can connect up hardware serial externally. That's not quite right because at that point I still I have to have a host driver um, on the USB target anyway to get to serial. Um, so at that point, um, you know, because I've had to add external hardware there for it, and I'm depending on, at this point, I'm depending on the infrastructure to actually go and you know, act as the host and configure that, that, that UART, I, I, I still need to depend on the, the system booting up to that point to get that. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't come for free um, uh, to turn that into a, a host port versus a slave port. Uh, the question is, the comment is you don't need USB at all on the target, you just use a USB to serial. Yeah, so you're still connecting to the hardware serial on the target. Uh, and that's, a, and, and if you look at what I've actually got, what I'm actually using on here, um, we don't do any of this in, in the production test, or, and we don't necessarily have it much on the, the, the board bring up. Um, occasionally we still do use USB serial, but that's exactly what I have here. This USB, uh, this USB side connection is actually on the, on the top board, is actually the USB to serial a converter that looks at the, the console. Um, so that's what's showing up in this, um, in this other, uh, get my arrows in the right place. Um, that's what's showing up in that other window. That's actually this USB to serial. So that, yes, that's, that's the state of it is today. My, my aspirations for this talk um, is actually to encourage those people who help maintain these subsystems um, to, to look at these issues of bringing up something like USB gadget networking and net console very early, looking at problems at, at consoles that are over it and, and translating those into the kernels, and look at doing this really without the serial debug net. Um, because at, you know, that might not be a, a this year or this two years thing, but like you know, three or four years down the line, 
um, we're, we're going to get into a situation where we just don't need the USB to serial anymore. It's, it's it, it, you know, it, it's just like we don't, we, for, for most of us in this room, we don't need JTAG anymore, right? You know, you're never not going to need JTAG, right? There's somebody's going to need JTAG. They're going to need to get into the, the shift registers of the device itself. But I'd say that, you know, does anybody use JTAG on a daily basis? Yeah, so you're, you're, you're in the minority at this point. Um, you know, so um, it's, uh, and, that, and, and serial is gonna go that way too. And that's, that, I'm trying to start trying that vector um, because serial is gonna go the, that, that way as well. Um, and not that it's not that it's not needed. I, I you know occasionally I still need JTAG, um, but it's it tends to be very specialized and very early on in the, in the architecture. We're just, there's just more infrastructure that's being already brought up, and before you know people are doing uh, board level system designs. Um, let me let me let me in conclusion here. Let me just show the the kernel running. So I loaded everything. Let me do uh, what's the first thing I need to do to load the kernel. Um, I should know this. Oh, run RAM args. Uh, all that does is set up boot args. So those, those are same boot args. And then I do boot Z, load address, um, and um, device tree. So the RAM disk and the device tree. And at that point, um, in all practical purposes, because I haven't done the EFI thing, I don't have the early kernel stuff, my net console stuff becomes largely useless. And, um, but we can go over here to the serial stuff. We see the kernel is booting right up. And I've got a RAM disk um, you know, root file system up. And I'm, loading, I'm running Linux entirely booted over USB. Um, no SD cards. Um, you know, um, that, that's straight from, from boot ROM. There's no boot medium on that device. It's just USB. Um, all from a JavaScript app. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, next steps. Let, this, this, this is the, 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 some of the motivation, right? It's to actually point to the problem. So thank you actually for, 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 for playing that because it's not ready for prime time. Uh, I mentioned the configFS thing. Um, you know, what I plan to try is gmulti to see if I can get it earlier on um, initially and then going from there to EFI. I don't understand it today, but, my under but what my fundamental belief is is that it, it does provide some way to, to extend the console um, from the bootloader into the, to the, to the kernel um, for initial boot so we can keep that open. Um, I mentioned the crash. If you leave the, the net console live or trying to do the TFTP, um, and, um, and then also just integrating in this into more things. Now that we've kind of got this root framework, um, we want to try to make sure it runs on different host architectures because, I mean, the, 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 the torpedo here is getting people running Windows and Mac systems to try out Linux, right? So this gives you a way to, to have them do that without having any real infrastructure. Um, and, um, you know, using Etcher for turning on flashing, doing other sort of automation in web USB. If you want to learn more about UEFI, last year Alexander Graf gave a rep talk. Um, so, uh, and that's it. I don't think I have any questions for uh, time for questions. I think I'm over. If you want to find me, I will be at the technical showcase uh, tomorrow. Um, please come by and see me there. Um, I'll also go stand at the back of the room uh, if you have any questions for me to, uh, today. Really appreciate your time and your patience. I hope you enjoyed that and are inspired. Um, thank you. <laughs>